conclude our day. But I'm so glad that everybody has come and attended. Uh, tonight's lesson is, if not you, then who? If not you, then who? So the title of the lesson is also Drop Your Nets. It is important that we understand what happened with, uh, what happened with people that uh, initially followed Jesus. So how much can you influence someone? And it's hard to say because we will never know how much we can truly influence somebody. So it's imperative that we, uh, that we strive to put ourselves in a good position, in a right position. So we're going to look at four men uh, who had different influences when it came to large scale and when it came to smaller scale. So let's look over at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. Uh, Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers. They were Simon, his uh, other name was Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were putting a net in the sea, and, and, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, I will make you fish for men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going from there, Jesus saw two other brothers. They were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And they were sitting in a boat with their father, mending their nets. Jesus called them, and at once they left the boat and their father and followed Jesus. So let's go ahead and consider first... Uh, I didn't click through that, I just read it. My apologies. So let's consider Simon, who is called Peter. We find him here, Matthew 4, 18, while walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw the two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So we were introduced with Peter. We know different aspects of Peter because we have the benefit of having inspired, the inspired Word of God. We know that he's known for being impulsive. In Matthew 14, 25 to 29, we read in the fourth watch of the night, uh, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, uh, That's the end of that. And he walked to Jesus. Now we know what happens is that he ends up, Lacking faith, falls into the water, and people end up looking and go, Wow, look at Peter. Peter lost faith. And Peter turned around and he fell in the water. But what's different about Peter is the other one stayed in the boat. They never even tried to get out. So we see how impulsive Peter is, but let's consider the strengths that Paul had. When Jesus foretold of someone who would stumble, Peter is very quick to deny that he was going to be one. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And we know that this happened. We see that Peter didn't want to believe what was coming. John 18, 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. Uh, the servant's name was Malchus. Now, I imagine that Peter wasn't intricate with his uh, swordsmanship. So when he was aiming, he's probably aiming to lob the guy's head off and ended up only getting his ear. He was very impulsive. We, see the, we see, saw that happen when Jesus was arrested in the garden. We see his impulsiveness was a benefit to him in his ministry. We all like to think at a time of calamity that we would do the right thing. And Peter learned from his lessons and was a strong spokesman for Christianity. We can be the same as referenced earlier in Acts 4.10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him uh, this man is standing before you well. Verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. In verses 18 to 20, So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We see that even though he was impulsive, he was someone who was still trying, and even in the face of adversity, still was like, I'm not going to give up, understanding what the punishment was. While Peter was someone that many would have given up on, but Jesus didn't, Peter ended up being a great apostle whose weakness was turned into a strength as he grew in maturity. Next we look at Andrew. 
In John 1, 41 and 42, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. He was also a fisherman, Matthew 4, 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. He introduced some Greeks to Jesus. We find this in John 12, 20 to 22. And that's just about all we know about Andrew. Is It's not all that much. But it was Andrew who introduced Peter to Jesus. It was imperative that Andrew be where he was when he was there. And while we look back and don't see Andrew playing a very big part, we need Andrews. We need people who are willing to, to work and to do the right thing and introduce people to Jesus. Next we look at James, the brother of John. He was also a fisherman by trade. We see that... Uh, uh, in verses 20 and 22 of John 12, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was with Beth, uh, Beth, uh, Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. That was the scripture I just missed. So James is where we are. Matthew 4, 21. And going on from there, he saw two old, other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother. And the boat was Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. In Luke 9, 53 to 54, But the people did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? James, we don't know much about, but here we see his attitude. Much like Peter, he was impulsive, he was fiery. And was like, oh yeah, they're going to do this? Let's kill them! And Jesus is like, hey, let's, let's pump the brakes just a little bit. We're, gonna, we're not going to go that far. So we see that he was believed to have this fiery temperament. Jesus even called him and his brother the sons of thunder. In Mark 3, 17, James the son of Zebedee and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name, uh, I can never pronounce that good, bon Bonerges? Is that, well, how do you pronounce it? Yes, that was it. That, that is the sons of thunder. So James, an interesting aspect of James is he was the first of the apostles to be killed. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So we end up finding that James, though we don't have much on him, was willing to stand firm for God, even facing death. He was impulsive like Peter. Jesus had to correct him. But he was someone who didn't back down. He was someone who did fight forward. He was somebody who was strong. We look at his brother now, John. He's called the brother of James. And uh, we, we see the same scripture again. In uh, Luke 5.10, uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Do not be afraid, from now on you will be catching men. We see that along like his brother and father, they were partners with Peter. Uh, he had a righteous indignation that was also rebuked by Christ. In Luke 9, 51-55, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. So we see that even though he was fiery, we find what he ends up being called. In John 13, 23, whenever you read the disciple whom Jesus loved, John is writing about himself. John 13, 23, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at, ta at the table uh, at, at Jesus' side. Uh, we see that he was among the first to, uh, to see the empty tomb. In John 19, 26, uh, oh, nope, I've got to back up a bit, I'm sorry. We see that Jesus' love for John showed while he was on the cross. We see here when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. Jesus loved John so much, knowing he was going to lose his earthly life basically on the cross. He said, John, take care of my mama. Make sure that she's okay. We see that type of relationship. There are people like John who are caregivers. 
that are able to take care and help other people, that that's something that they are respected and well known for, something that we need in the brotherhood. We move on to the correct part, John, uh, John uh, 20, verse, uh, verses 2 to 8. Uh, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't, do not know where they've laid him. So imagine they're running. And uh, John 20, verse 4, both of them were running together, and the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. This kind of makes me laugh a little bit, because I can imagine they both get to the tomb. They're kind of huffing and puffing, and John could kind of be like, hey, I beat you here. And Peter's like, yeah, but nobody's going to believe you. And then John writes this, and the other disciple outran Peter. It just kind of tickles me a little bit. I doubt that happened, but it's kind of funny to read that. It's like, nobody will believe that it happened. Oh, yeah, they will. So he wrote it down. So we see in verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is the Lord. I didn't finish the verse that's on there, but what we end up finding is that they go in and find Jesus. He's not there. Everything is folded. It's not like somebody came and ransacked the body of Jesus and stole it. It's obvious that, that something miraculous happened. So he recognized Jesus following the resurrection in John 21 and verse 7. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard uh, that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. John also penned the gospel account, three letters, uh, three letters in the book of Revelation. He was imprisoned for Christ when he penned the book of Revelation on the Sea of Patmos. Or on the island of Patmos, the revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1.1, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to, sir, uh, to his servant John. So we find that he didn't die young. He was an older man. James died young, uh, serving God. He didn't. That, that shows us that, we're all, that lives are going to be different. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're going to be martyred, but it also doesn't mean that you're going to get to have a long and happy and prosperous life. The goal is to get to heaven, not, not prosperity. One of, the men, uh, one of the people that I talk about in this is also Zebedee. Zebedee had to have been an older man. Let's just for the sake of argument say that James and John are in their 20s. And for the sake of argument, if Zebedee was in his mid-40s to early 50s running a fishing business and he loses his two strapping sons, that was a great sacrifice because then the job was his. So for, for them to be able to go, he was willing to put in that extra work to be able to keep that business going. So with James and John leaving, we have to remember that, that heart that Zebedee had had is it was a great loss for him to lose his sons, but for them to serve God was amazing, and it was great. So it took Christ saying to these people to follow him. They dropped their nets to follow the great teacher. So what good could be done by us with a simple thing like, would you like to come to church services, or would you like to have a Bible study? These are people who are looking to drop their nets they could do something wonderful for God. We just have to look for opportunities to share the gospel. There are going to be some people who the brotherhood all knows for their ability to get up and speak and speak effectively, and they're able to go out and study with a wide variety of people and they obey the gospel. But somebody had to lead them to Christ. When we understand with humility, you may not be quote-unquote famous or you may not get this earthly recognition. You may not be Peter. We've got to have Andrews. We've got to have people that can, that can live like James, that are going to understand the truth and not back down from it. We need to have men like John who are going to be caretakers, who, could, who, who Jesus knew would take care of his mother. We need to have people who are like Zebedee as well that sometimes you may have to lose something to gain something greater for the kingdom. So when we look at, when we look at the lesson, it's not, if not you, then who? We've got to drop our nets. And it, it's easy to get wrapped up in your work. It's easy to get wrapped up in your job and in your studies and to neglect serving God. I'm not saying you've got to quit your job to be a Christian, but drop the nets of the importance with that. Remember what truly is most important, and that is your Christianity. That's the final point that we have for our third lesson. It's also the shortest one. So we will uh, we'll open it up for some Q&A about different types of people that serve God and whatever other questions you may have.
Any comments? Any gripe, complaint? No. Um, you think about, I guess I'll, I'll start off with one. Uh, as far as uh, you think about, you, know, you mentioned Andrew, you mentioned all these other individuals that at times we are, I don't mean overshadowed, but at least sometimes we tend to when we think about no. people like Paul, when we think about people like Peter. Uh, you know, we don't know a whole lot more about Andrew, at least, out, uh, at least what we find in the confines of Scripture. Um, when we think about individuals like that, how can we remind ourselves that we don't need to necessarily be, we don't necessarily need to be Paul's, uh, but we can be Andrew's. If we reminded ourselves of that every day, how, how can we do that? Yeah, we, sometimes we need to think back at, Andrew didn't know that he was going to be a minor person in the Bible, but I imagine that he did many really good things that we just don't know about. And that happens in a congregation's life blood or, or however you would describe that is while Paul may be the preacher here there's so many other things that are just as important as getting up for a total of 80 minutes on a Sunday there's so many more things that are important that it, that that will that reach into the community and there are some people that's like if I'm not preaching then I'm not going to participate and Paul and I know preachers that are like that and but we have to understand that true Christianity it's a lot more Andrews People that aren't seeking the spotlight, not saying Paul's seeking the spotlight, but there are people who do. But not people who seek the glory or the spotlight, but people who want people to come to Jesus, want to take care of people, want to love people. So it's somewhere where you've got to find your strength and, and embody that and, and, and do your best to serve God with that. Do you recommend any ways uh, as far as us assessing what our strength is? If we are a giver or, or a caretaker or uh, I mean, something like that. You can take a personal, trial yeah, trial and error, personal assessment. What do I feel good at? What are areas I need to work on? And, I mean, it could be something y'all collectively do as a congregation if you want to and say, you know, we have a lot of people that do this, but we don't necessarily have a lot of people who are... Who are in this side? Is there, is there, would there be anybody that would be willing to work to labor in this area? And not just be something like, hey, I see that we're deficient in this, Paul. <laughs> so, I mean, it's one of those things that we need to find people that have those strengths and abilities and not just rain it down on one or more people, but to, to make more full everything. So, yeah, it could be self-assessment, but it could also be bringing those together in a congregational assessment. What's something that we see we're lacking in? How do we improve in that? Who'd be willing to run with that and embrace it? Are there any other questions? Jerry? Yes. Gerald. Gerald. <laughs> Sorry, I got a lazy eye. I made my ex-girlfriend mad. I'd be seeing her and someone else on the side. So. <laughs> Right. Like when you do a self-assessment and say, well, I think I'm good at this, I like this. But then you have to think, but the needs of the body, like you right. talked about earlier, um, I need to aspire yeah. to that. Um, and that's, I don't know, something I guess, you know, definitely, maybe in a smaller congregation, um, is to always be looking at, that needs to be filled, how can I, how can I grow to fill it? Right. See, I never, uh, I got stuck in the fourth to sixth grade class because the rotation of teachers I had, we hit a quarter that none of them could teach. And I'd always said, I mean, somebody's going to have to teach it and it might be me. And so I ended up having to eat my words. And I'm like, how, how am I going to talk? I mean, how am I going to teach fourth to sixth graders? I mean, I'd never taught that young. And I got in there and found out it was a strength. It was something I perceived as a weakness. Come to find out, I mean, I love teaching that age group because of how excited they were to learn and they were soaking things in and, and that sort of thing. So there's some things that we may not even know that it's a strength yet. So it's something that we have to actively try. So, yes. And that's to me where uh, our elders, the, the older people with wisdom, can take those younger people and, and, and encourage them and be trainers. Uh, and I think that's an church could use those older people more and say, hey, could you talk to so-and-so? Because you've got experience or mm -hmm. just, you know, feeling like your, your wisdom as an experienced person is very valuable. Right. Encourage people to try it. 
the best type of congregation is one that have older people and younger people. Because if you have a congregation of only older people, you don't have the energy. It's just impossible. I mean, as you get older, there are issues come up with being older. I mean, you can't go out and knock doors in 100 degree heat when you can barely walk across the parking lot. And younger people have that energy to be able to do that. But if you have a congregation that is only younger people, you're going to run into some immaturity issues. Uh, again, experience isn't something you have until right after you need it. So it's, uh, it's, we've got a, a, a vibrant congregation has to find a way to marry the knowledge and uh, bridle the excitement together that, uh, and the energy that younger people have to work together to get everything running smoothly. It's that whole part of the body being vibrant and, and whole with God. If there's a part that's not there, the body does start to curl up and to fall apart. And like I talked about with my ankle, you mess up how you walk, it, it can hurt you all the way up to your neck. So I think people can vouch for that. I remember being a kid, I, I played football in high school. In Arkansas, we started something new called the five days in May, my, my junior year, where we got to put pads on for five days and just got to, he got to see how we had done in off season, the coaches did. And I remember playing on the defensive line and I was trying to get through the guard and the tackle to get into the backfield and the guard accidentally stepped over and cracked my ankle. And I remember, ah, oh, that kind of hurts. And I walked it off and was like, okay, I'm good. Well, like the next week, uh, I took off one of my white socks and saw something black on my leg. And I'm like, why do I have, I mean, I wasn't wearing dress socks, you know, leave the little fuzzy things. So I look down at it, I have a bruise from halfway up my leg all the way down to the bottom of my foot with pooled blood in the bottom. Like I had done something and didn't even take a playoff. And now I'll walk into the living room in the morning and Lisa's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I think I slept on one side too long last night. I mean, it's, uh, our bodies, uh, they, 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 in some ways they get better, some ways they get worse. So for a congregation to really be vibrant is you have to understand where you are and grow in that role. I mean, you look in Titus, I believe it's chapter 2, older women teach the younger women. And you want to make some women mad, tell them they're older women now. I mean, tell them that they're older women and they need to start, be, start talking to those young, uh, those young women that are that, uh, the young wives. And, hey, this is how you love your husband. Let me tell you how to, not, how to stop some of the fights that you're going to endure that I may have had to endure. And the, the older men are the same way, except we can, older men seem to kind of more embrace that we're older men. So then it, then it happens for the ladies. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Not just because you're trying to say, ah, uh -huh, I told you so. Yeah. So I, I think the attitude, and obviously the Christian humbleness, the, the kindness factors in there, but it really needs to be somebody who wants to do it to help the person. Yeah. You can be right, but then you have that friction. Yeah. Uh, there should never be a place for, aha, I told you so. That's definitely not how it should be. But we need to be looking to help others with our experiences and help others make, not to make mistakes like I like. Let's say Cody finds a girl and gets married. And I'm like, hey, Cody, bro, if you'll do this, it'll work out. And if he's like, well, why? I'm just like, D just trust me. This is, I, I did this and this is what happened. You know, if you, change, if you don't do this, your marriage will be happier. But if he's like, I'm not going to listen to your advice. I'm going to do what I want to do. And, and, and like ends up having problems with his wife, I can't be like, ha, told you so. It needs to be like, okay, man, this is how you can fix it now that you've, <laughs> since you didn't listen the first time, let me give you a little more advice as, uh, that you can continue with forward. So it needs to be a good and willing sharing of advice. But I mean, it's also one of those, just because somebody's older doesn't mean that they're more, a more mature Christian. We have people who've been Christians for 50 years that are still babes in Christ. We have 16-year-olds that obeyed the gospel when they were 12 that dived into the Word of God and are more spiritually mature than older people. So it's one of those deals you have to try to be maturing and share what you can effectively share. I mean, it's, uh, my dad told me a joke when I was a kid um, that a car had broken down uh, in front of uh, an insane asylum. 
and uh, the, car, the, the tire had just fallen off, the lug nuts had all disappeared, and there was a guy standing at the fence watching him. And uh, this guy's like, what am I going to do? And the guy that's in the institution looks at him and goes, why don't you just take one lug nut off of each, each tire and put the spare on and you'll be able to get to town. And the guy was like, well, I thought you were crazy. He goes, I am crazy, but I'm not dumb. <laughs> So, I mean, we need to strive, and with, I mean, life throws us experiences to deal, and that we have to deal with, and, and looking through a Christ-like lens to help others behind us, that's basically what we see with take joy in your trials. It doesn't mean we have to be giddy when we lose a parent, but what it means is if I continue to fight through that for Christ, then when somebody else has that happen, I'm now equipped to be able to help them in their walk. So there are some people who've been dealt so many horrible things in their life but when they help others with some of those things, it is such a blessing and benefit that somebody's going to be now able to draw closer to Christ because of their experiences. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Um, yes, uh, one thing that I was going to ask you, um, you know, talking about everything that we've covered in these three sessions, and you look at Acts chapter 2, what are some things that are taken from Acts chapter 2 that you see that you've talked about that were modeled in Acts chapter 2? I mean, the early church, the, the best example that we can return back to. We've got to remember we're converting people to Christ. We're not converting people to our club or our rules, and we're just trying to drag them into the baptistry and immerse them. I mean, uh, an example that I use with my teenage boys is I said, if there was a girl, and no matter how pretty she is, if she walked up to you in the mall and handed you a list and said, these are all the things you're going to do for me now, you're my boyfriend. And it's like, call me every morning, send me sweet text messages, tell me I'm pretty, bring me coffee. I mean, all these, well, I don't know you, no matter how pretty she is, I'm tossing that list. And sometimes we do that with the church. We walk up to somebody and we're like, you're sinning. You're in sin. You got to stop. Why? They don't, I mean, they don't know why. They don't, have any, they don't have any reason to know why. It's like the dog that goes outside and rolls in something gross and wants to run into the house and lick you in the face. They don't know that they smell gross. So you have to kind of take the dog outside, give it a little bath before it's able to come back in. And there are some of our worldly friends that don't understand what sin is. So we need to be letting them know about Jesus and know about God and the great love that God has for them. And the more they fall in love with God, the more they see the statutes and go, Oh, okay. I can do that. I mean, uh, yeah, that's what it takes to be a Christian. Yes, I'll do that because I love God and I know what he's done for me. When we convert people to Christ instead of a list of rules, I mean, that's where we really start seeing disciple making. Any other thoughts? Any other questions? JJ, do you have anything you want to wrapping it up? Anything no. Thank you so much for uh, having me. Uh, I hope it's been beneficial. I just want to encourage you to try things in your Christian walk you never have. Don't, it, it's easy to be complacent. You never taught a class, teach a class. You've never given a talk, give a talk. You've never helped in the pantry, help in the pantry. You've never tried to set up a Bible study with someone, take Paul with you. I mean, Paul has a Bible study. Can I go with you to see how you do it? Find a way to grow actively and that's how you grow as a Christian is you actively look for opportunities you see deficiencies try to grow in those areas it's an active effort to grow as a Christian well thank you JJ very much for and thank you everyone here for your participation JJ for bringing us these awesome lessons that I know for myself personally have been extremely encouraging uh, a lot of self inspection uh, on my part as a leader as a person who's striving to be a leader uh, in the church. I guess at this time, uh, since we are getting out early, we said it's going to two, but since we're done, I mean, you guys get to go home a little earlier. Um, hopefully we stay, stick around and fellowship a little bit more before we do leave. But once again, uh, tomorrow, uh, JJ is going to continue the rest of the seminar and Bible class, as well as he's going to preach uh, in the morning service. So if you, if this, isn't, this isn't all that he had to talk about. I mean, this is awesome stuff today, but if you want to learn more about having, how to rise up and lead how to be an individual who's going to step up, be, be at worship tomorrow, be a Bible class tomorrow, and get to hear more of that. Also, we're having a potluck tomorrow, and so that's something to look forward to as well, the fellowship. Oh. Yeah, Cody said amen. The clarification, when I was saying the thing about it was gross to put spaghetti in chili and that was dumb, 
I was just trying to do a little Texas rivalry. If you bring that type of chili, I'm going to eat it. And I'm going to like it because I've had it before. I didn't mean that it was dumb per se. I was trying to joke around I'm a Texan. But no, there's very rare. Like, he was telling me about chili that they put chocolate in. And I'm like, yeah, I'll try it. So I'm not going to say anything's dumb. It was perceived that I was saying something wasn't right. I was just doing the fun Texas rivalry, our chili's the best, that sort of thing. It, of course it is. I mean, um, but that doesn't mean that others are bad. It's just ours is the best. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone again for being here.